appreciate you coming out tonight to support the Southern Voices Conference and the Hoover Public Library and Arts in Alabama. We are extremely excited to welcome you back in person this year for our Southern Voices Conference. Before we get started, I wanted to introduce a few people. Uh, our library director, Amanda Borden, is in the back, as well as our Southern Voices Conference co-chairs. We have Teresa Davis and Carrie Steinmel. And we also have Matina Johnson. She is going to be joining us virtually. She's moderating the Zoom portion of our event tonight. Say hello, Matina. Hi, everyone. We are excited to be joining you from the virtual world. We currently have 23 participants on Zoom, and I will be um, fielding questions from our virtual participants later on in the evening. So as you know, artwork plays a vital role in our Southern Voices Conference, as well as at the library in general and the city as a whole. The library is home to a number of art galleries. The George P. Farmer Gallery is on our administrative level. The Children's Gallery and the Plaza Gallery are on our main level. And the Friends Gallery and Southern Voices Galleries are on this level, the theater level. The Southern Voices Gallery is made up of a permanent collection of pieces dating back to 1997. And the newly remodeled main level of City Hall is home to the gallery at City Hall. So I hope you'll go over and take a look at that gallery next time you are at this complex. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome artist and educator, Kathy Fussell, who lives and works in Columbus, Georgia. She is a practicing fiber artist and has worked for more than 50 years. Kathy's been working with textiles since her childhood in Buena Vista, Georgia, her hometown. In 2011, she retired from Columbus State University following a long career as an English professor. Today, she maintains a studio where she specializes in creating art quilts and related works in fabric. Fussell's imagery generally falls into three major categories, regional geography, Southern literature, and American modernism. Fussell's art is held in a number of public collections. Included among them are two major works in the Fulton County Public Arts Collection and six large pieces in the Memorial Sloan Kettering Coke Collection in New York, New York. Additional examples of her artwork have been exhibited in numerous juried and curated art ex exhibitions around the South and beyond. And her work is held in dozens of private collections around the nation and abroad. Her show currently here in Hoover, Alabama will soon be followed by others in Bath, Maine, Athens, Georgia, and Tupelo, Mississippi. In 2016, Fussell was commissioned by the prestigious Congressional Club in Washington, DC to make a special quilt for the First Lady, Michelle Obama. The result was Apollo Splashdown Revisited, homage to Alma Woodsy Thomas. That piece was presented to Mrs. Obama by the Congressional Club at their annual First Ladies Luncheon in Washington, DC during the final year of the Obama presidency. And that work will be included in the permanent collection of the forthcoming Barack Obama Presidential Library in Chicago. Please join me in a warm welcome for Kathy Fussell as we ask her to give us just a little bit of insight into her intriguing work. Thank you, Elin, for that introduction. And thank you, Elin and Jennifer Marshall and Scott Littleton up there in the booth for all the great work they have done in planning and executing this exhibition and event. They've been a pleasure to work with. They have all the great qualities. They've been uh, organized. They have been ahead of schedule, the way I like to be. They have been uh, hospitable and they've been patient with me. So thank you all, the whole crew here has just been wonderful. And thank y'all audience members for coming out tonight. And uh, thank everybody out there in Zoomlandia for tuning in. Uh, it's great to see a few familiar faces here in the audience. And it was wonderful just a few minutes ago to meet some brand new cousins that we didn't even know we had till we got here. <laughs> hey, for cousins. So um, 
It's great to be here in this beautiful facility, the Hoover Public Library, and it's great to be in Alabama, a state that has so informed my work. You'll see uh, several pieces of my work that have been uh, inspired by the Alabama landscape, and there's much more of it. Um, I am a Georgian. I've lived virtually all my life in Georgia, but I can see Alabama from where I live, for real. We live just a few blocks from, just a stone's throw from the Chattahoochee, and we live on the second floor of a converted cotton mill. And we look, we have west facing windows by our choice in the building so that we can see Alabama. My husband, Fred, is a native of Alabama and he wanted to be sure to see Alabama. So we look at Alabama off and on all day long. And uh, I walk on the river walk on the Alabama side too. So Alabama is very important. Uh, but beyond that, I, I grew up in Buena Vista, Georgia, but uh, my maternal grandparents lived in North Louisiana. So throughout my childhood and early adulthood, my family a couple of times a year made the trip, drove out to North Louisiana from Buena Vista, crossed Alabama. Then my children wound up attending University of Mississippi. We're crossing Alabama some more. And uh, one of our children still lives in Alabama, in uh, Mississippi. So we continue to cross Alabama. And, it, and it's just, a, a, it's truly, the landscape has inspired much of my work. I have a quilt entitled North Alabama Hillsides. I have a quilt entitled uh, Alabama Road Cut. And I have uh, plans in my head for a quilt titled The Springtime Mimosa Tunnel Between Birmingham and Tupelo. Um, so it's great to be here in Alabama. Um, I want to give you a little uh, kind of uh, heads up about what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm first going to talk about uh, just a little bit about what a quilt is. Uh, then I want to show you my first map quilt. Then I want to take an in-depth look at two of the larger, the two largest quilts that are out there in the exhibit. Then a less in-depth, a more zoomed back look at some of the other pieces that are in the exhibit. And then we'll wind up with uh, some of my work that's not in the exhibit. So um, first of all, um, sometimes people look at my work and I know that they have the question, what makes that a quilt? That doesn't look like a bed cover to me. I don't want to sleep under that thing. It's not big enough to put on a bed. And that's all true. But not all quilts are bed covers and not all bed covers are quilts. And I'm sure that most of y'all know that. But just in case, I want to cover what makes my work quilts. Um, bed covers, you know, there, there's a variety of bed covers. There's uh, afghans, there's uh, bed spreads, there's blankets, there's uh, canopies, uh, coverlets. Um, but what makes a quilt different is the fact that, and then they can all be made out of the same materials. They can all be made out of cotton or linen or wool or silk, you know, polyester. But what makes a quilt different is that a quilt is composed of three layers. The back, the, bat, the middle, which we call the batting. Some people want to call it stuffing, but we quilters call it batting. In England, they call it wadding. But the middle is batting and then the top. Now the top gets a lot of the attention because it's often colorful and elaborate. It can be pieced, it can be uh, embroidered, it can be whole cloth, or it can be uh, appliqued. And applique means pieces cut out and applied to a whole cloth. So the top can be uh, you know, any number of compositions. But what ties these three layers together is the quilting stitch that can be taken by hand or machine. So what makes a quilt different from all other bed covers is the three layer composition tied together with, uh, sewn together with the quilting stitch. So you have quilt the noun, which is the object and quilt the verb, which is the placement of the stitches to tie the three layers together. Excuse the little English teacher uh, trend, you know. I can't, I can't help it. I bounce back sometimes. Um, so that's what a quilt is. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna show you my first map quilt. That's the first map quilt I made about eight years ago. It's the Alabama, Alabama River at G's Bend, which I'm sure some of you recognize. It's about four feet tall by about six feet wide. It hangs in my living room. It's the first time I used canvas. I use canvas a lot as opposed to regular uh, quilt weight cotton. 
Uh, it was the first time I used Canvas. It was a, one of the first, it was the first map quilt I made. It's one of the first times that I uh, employed the technique of free motion quilting. Now, let me quickly explain what free motion quilting is. You do it on the machine. And, you know, normally when you sew on a sewing machine, you can only go in one direction. The machine pulls the fabric through and you only can sew in that direction or maybe you can, you know, back up for a few stitches if you need to back stitch. But you can't do a lot of maneuvering. You can do gentle curves, but not a lot of maneuvering. Well, to do free motion quilting, you rig your machine in a certain way so that you can move the fabric freely underneath the needle and you can quilt in circles and all kinds of script and all kinds of directions. And um, think of it as it's similar to a situation in which you would have a pencil, a drawing instrument, uh, suspended in this direction and you're moving the paper underneath the pencil. It's, that's the way to think about free motion quilting. I'm moving the fabric underneath the needle. The difference between uh, the, the way that, it, that uh, free motion quilting uh, sort of departs from that uh, drawing analogy is that with free motion quilting, you're also, the quilter's having to control the length of the stitch. So I have to coordinate my uh, motor speed on the machine with how fast I'm moving my hands. So that's free motion quilting. I employ that technique a lot, not exclusively, but a lot. And that's the Alabama River at G's Bend. Now let's take a deep dive into this bad boy. <laughs> that's the big one, the Margravate of Azealia, that is a little over eight feet high and a little, a few inches under eight feet wide. Now, it, it was inspired by this map. Here's the story of this map. In 1717, a Scotsman, a Scottish nobleman by the name of Sir Robert Montgomery was granted a big chunk of land between the Altamaha and Savannah rivers in what later became the colony of Georgia. Now we're talking 1717. So it's before Georgia was even a colony. But this Scotsman was granted this big section of land and he immediately came, well, I don't know how immediately, at some point he came up with the idea of what we would call now selling off lots. So this map was published, he published this map in a tract or brochure that advertised this, these uh, lots for sale and it was distributed widely. Uh, now, let me turn on this pointer and see if I can show you some, uh, yeah. Uh, First of all, it's 20 miles across and 20 miles down. So we're talking 400 square miles that this development encompasses. In the middle is the big house, the home of the Margrave, it's a Spanish term. Um, and surrounding the big house are formal gardens and uh, a bit of a park. These, these 116 uh, squares were represented uh, one square mile lots. And on each one, as you'll see in a minute, is a house. Those are supposed to be the homes of the landed gentry. These four big areas he called the great parks and one had uh, deer in it, one had horses, one had sheep and one had, uh, what was it, pigs, I think. And um, outside there, are the gardens and row crops, no, the gardens and orchards, and they are tended by the people, the indentured servants who live in these little houses. You, you'll see them in a minute. These, they're little houses, with cabins out here. Here are the row crops that had to be tended by the indentured servants who also tended the orchards and gardens. And then out here is the fortification. 20, 40, 60, 80 miles of fortification with cannons. And the, uh, that had to be manned also by the indentured servants. So if you went to live at the Margravate of Zelia, it was not necessarily uh, you know, a, a plush life. 
Uh, now let's look back at the, uh, the quilt. Um, that's my rendition of the Margravate of Azilia. This, by the way, never came to fruition um, due to probably a number of different uh, factors. It never was realized. There never was really uh, a Margravate of Azilia. Um, the Margravate of Azilia has been called, uh, it's believed to be the earliest example of American art created by westward expansion. Now, I don't know about that, but I learned about the Margravate of Azilia when I was in third grade Georgia history, and I loved the term. I had not seen the map at that point, but I loved the term and I became fascinated with it. And then when I was in high school in the 60s during the uh, Vietnam War and the civil rights movement was uh, raging, some of my buddies and I uh, were sitting around one evening um, uh, voicing concern about the fact that one of our buddies was about to be drafted. And one member of the group made the statement, oh, I just wish I were back in the Margravate of Azilia. So the term has stuck with me all this time. I've been thinking for years about making this quilt. And finally, in 2019, I set about it. I, made, I laid my plans and set about it. And I worked on it about nine months. And uh, so here it is, and I'll show you some close-ups. There's the big house in the middle, the, Margrave, the Margrave's house, and the formal garden surrounding the house. There's a close-up of the orchards and gardens. And I tell you, the orchards and gardens gave me a run for my money because it was hard to come up with all those shapes that looked sort of like <laughs> Uh, what they needed to look like. You can also see the cabins there and you also can see the row crops and you get a little bit of a view of the uh, fortifications and the cannons. I had fun making the cannons. There's the lettering at the top. Um, people who look at the quilt, uh, can't, you know, it's hanging up high so you often don't get a good look at that so I decided to put in a slide so that you could see maybe get an idea of how I did that it's all thread it's all stitching and then here's some of the homemade tools I used to make that quilt um, the nickel was the wheel on the big cannon <laughs> and there my uh, formal garden little pieces of paper there at the bottom so that's the Margravate of Azilia. This is snake shells on the Chattahoochee. Now the one out in the hall is white and this one's green, but they're essentially, they're just alike. Uh, back about five years ago, I was asked by the Chattahoochee River Conservancy to make a quilt for them to auction for their annual fundraiser. So I thought long and hard about what I could, would do because I had lots and lots of options. They gave me carte blanche. So, uh, I was looking at what appeals to me, what often gets my attention is the curve. I love the curves of rivers. I'm looking for curves. And um, I have to tell y'all, Alabama has way more curvaceous rivers than Georgia does. Georgia's rivers pretty much just go to the ocean, either the Atlantic or the Gulf. And Alabama rivers, because of the geology, the geologists tell me, are very, very, very curvy. The Alabama, you know, it's real curvy. So, um, but this, there are a few dramatic curves just south of Columbus, and this is one or two of them. Uh, it's about 20 miles south of Columbus. This piece of ground that I'm covering here is uh, about 2.9 miles across and a little more than three miles down. And um, those are the real topographical lines there on that quilt from the US, Ge US Geological Survey. Uh, I say sometimes the U.S. Geological Survey is my BFF. I use uh, them a lot. And um, of course, Alabama's on your right and uh, oh, Georgia's on your right and Alabama's on your left. Now, let me show you a few. Uh, this is a really good, uh, the history of this piece of land is really interesting to me. Um, of course, in the early days, Creek Indians lived here. But then in, 16, in, the, in, the, in 1690, 
the Spanish came in and built a fort right in here. Fort Apalachicola was there for about a year. It only lasted about a year. And there's nothing of it left now. Archaeologists have, uh, have worked there, but there's nothing left of the fort now. Then in the 1830s, a plantation here was owned by one James Boykin. Now there's an Alabama name, isn't it? Um, and uh, he had a big house in Columbus and a plantation down here on the river. Then in the 1930s, the Catholics built a mission up here, and that's Holy Trinity, which still exists to this day. Um, Fort Benning is not too far over here. Fort Benning is off the map, off this map, but it's not too, too far over in here. So, you know, over time, this land has been used by all different kinds of, I guess any plot of land is, but I find this particularly interesting. Now, when I was making this quilt, I got to, these, these chunks, this and this and this. And of course, there were no topographical lines there, no contour lines there because it's just flat floodplain, river floodplain. And on a quilt, you can't have these big open spaces that aren't quilted when everything else is quilted. So I started thinking about what I could put there. And some of my um, friends were telling me, put houses, put this, put that. I think Scott's trying to tell me something. Oh. Oh, the, am I doing that? Oh, I'm sorry. I had my arm on it. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Oh, I really messed up, didn't I? What do I do here? Okay. From, from current slide. But no, I don't want to do that. Okay, we'll go ahead. I'll find it. Sorry. I put my arm on the keyboard. There we are. Okay, so I didn't know what to do with those big blank spots. So I consulted a farm historian to, uh, I decided I could put plowed fields and I could feature some of my hand quilting there. So I consulted a farm historian who, uh, to find out which direction I needed my rows to go. So he told me that over time, they'd done it this way and this way and this way and this way. So I could put them any direction I wanted to. So, so that was good, that was fun. So that, that, this quilt features uh, both free motion quilting and uh, hand quilting. This is an Alabama quilt. It is the Tennessee River up in North Alabama and uh, Florence, Florence is right in there. Muscle Shoals is right in here. Decatur is off the map over here. And of course the Mississippi line comes in right here. Now these, all these little lines, these are the waterways. These are waterways that feed the Tennessee River. I've had a lot of call for this river. People, it seems that people, I don't know why, but people who live on the Tennessee River up in North Alabama have uh, over and over again commissioned pieces of that river. And it's fine with me because I like that river. <laughs> I put these three up uh, together because I wanted to show you the three different kinds of quilting uh, uh, approaches here. And the one on, your, on the far left is the waterways. I've quilted the waterways that feed the river. The one in the middle, I've quilted the true topographical contour lines that indicate ele elevation. And when you look closely at those lines, and we'll, I think we'll see one later that's a little closer, I usually make uh, dark red lines for the uh, 100 foot elevations. And then there's a, a tan line, there are five tan lines between, or four tan lines between the uh, red lines. The red, there's, so that there's a 100 foot change in elevation between the red lines and a 20 foot change in elevation between the tan lines. When you're out there looking at the quilt and we'll look closer in a minute, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now I don't put the numbers on the quilts. The maps themselves have numbers so you can tell whether the elevation's going up or down. And I don't put the numbers so you can't tell whether the elevation's going up and down, but you can figure it out if you look at it. I mean, you know that uh, for instance, on the Snake Shoals quilt there in the middle, all that dense 
uh, contour business there in the lower right, you know there's a bluff. There's a bluff right there by the river. This is Lake Fontana in North Carolina. The Nantahala feeds this lake and several other uh, rivers all come together right there. And there's some waterways on there. Oh, I failed to tell you about the third, the third quilt here, which is the um, Alabama River at G's Bend again, uh, a smaller version than, uh, than the big one I showed you earlier. The quilting lines on this one are what I call fantasy contour lines. The scale of this map is not such that I could do the actual contour lines. When I can do the actual contour lines from the USGS maps, I do. But if the scale is not right, and this, you know, this, the G's Bend covers a big area, so the scale would not be, it would not be possible for me to do the contour lines. So I do something that sort of suggests contour lines or plowed lines. So that's what you see there. And again, this is the uh, Lake Fontana in North Carolina. Bryson City is off to the left of this. This is not a river, but it is titled Providence. And it's my rendition of Providence Canyon down in Southwest Georgia near Lumpkin in Stewart County. I grew up visiting Providence Canyon when I was a kid and we still visit occasionally. If you've never been to Providence Canyon, you should go, it's beautiful. The, uh, all these different colors of clay down in there and their plants down in the bottom that don't grow anywhere else. And it's the, the vistas off the rim of the canyon are just beautiful. It's a state park. And it's, you don't have to be, uh, you know, uh, an athlete to, to go down in, the, to walk down in there and out. They're, they're relatively easy ways to walk down in there and out. I, I, I heartily suggest a visit to Providence Canyons. It's beautiful. These are uh, almost all uh, hand dyed fabrics. I dye a good bit of my fabric. And this is almost all completely um, hand quilted. There's a little bit of machine quilting on it. This is a piece I recently finished and I shipped it out yesterday. A collector in Cincinnati bought it. And <laughs> it's an Alabama scene. I, one day I was just looking at maps, just scanning maps to see what appealed to me. And I saw this topography and just loved it. Uh, it's just so unusual. And so I set about making a quilt. This is about two and a half feet wide, three feet, I mean, two and a half feet tall, three feet wide. It, the title of this one is The True and Accurate Topography of a Place Just North of the Coondog Cemetery in Alabama. So it's just south of Cherokee, Alabama. I first titled it that, and then I saw that the Coondog Cemetery is there. I said, I have to put that in the title. Uh, there's no big rivers, but there's creeks, and uh, I just, that topography is just so unusual. I want to go up there and look at this landscape. This is not too far from here. It's Bankhead uh, uh, Lake on the Black Warrior River, and um, I, that's a relatively new quilt. Do y'all recognize this one? Yes. Lake Martin. And I tell you, this one put my cutting hand to the test, cutting all this little, little ins and outs. Uh, I really had to let my cutting hand rest for a little while after I made that one. And I, this is a, about a three foot by three foot quilt. And um, I got requests for smaller ones. And I said, well, if I make a smaller one, <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna be able to cut it out. So I did it in stitches. And uh, there's a small pillow uh, cover. And I think maybe the owners of this one are in the audience. Yeah, there they are. Good to see y'all. This is the Tom Bigby, and you might wonder why I'm showing somebody's kitchen, but here's the deal. Um, about four years ago, I was contacted by a young man from Corinth, Mississippi, and he was engaged to be married and wanted to give his wife uh, a Christmas gift and a an, uh, wedding gift. And he wanted one of my quilts. And I said, well, I don't have a Mississippi piece right now. I can make one, but we don't have time before Christmas or your wedding. But he loved this quilt. He picked this one out. It's the Tom Bigby down in Southwest Alabama, down, uh, let's see, Washington County. It's the border between Washington and Clark County down there. 
And so he bought the quilt for her and I hadn't, I knew they liked, they sent me notes saying they liked it, but I hadn't heard from them in three years until yesterday, not about three days ago, she, the recipient of this wrote me and said, we just redid our kitchen and I wanted you to see our quilt hanging in the kitchen. And I just love where they have it hanging and how it looks in there. And here's a closer view of it. And look at that strange topography. Um, when, I fin when I was working on that, my husband, Fred, who knows a little bit about geology, uh, doubted that I was really quilting the actual topography, but, but it, I promise it really is. But I love how they have it hanging there in their kitchen. And Oh, this is the Cahaba. This is where Shade Creek meets the Cahaba. You see Shade Creek coming in there to the Cahaba. And I, I, I thought this one just turned out really nice. I like this one. This one is probably the most challenging piece map that I've made at Signal Mountain in Tennessee. Um, topography is that uh, up in the upper right, the orange piece is uh, the city limits of Signal Mountain. Uh, this one was uh, a challenge. And the woman who commissioned this one, uh, she just wanted three pieces that, to go together in her house and uh, so she didn't know specifically what she wanted. So I showed her this, not really realizing how difficult it would be. And then I got into it and it was really rough. And, but I, you know, I enjoyed it and, and she really loved it. But then uh, I, was, I was hoping she didn't expect that much work on the next two. But anyway, we made two more and they were, they were fine. This is up in North Georgia. It's uh, Etowah and... Uh, I just really love that topography and that bend in that river too. A chef in Atlanta commissioned this one. She, uh, it's her family's home place. This is Cumberland Island off the coast of Georgia. Uh, I, once a year, I uh, make a piece and donate to one of the environmental causes for their fundraiser. And so last year I did Wild Cumberland and I uh, made this quilt for the Cum Wild Cumberland benefit and it was auctioned off. And um, <laughs> the scientists uh, love to correct me on my quilts. And uh, <laughs> one of them made the comment when I posted this somewhere that uh, I had the ocean currents wrong. <laughs> so, so I studied my ocean currents and when I made Sapelo, I, I got them right. <laughs> That's Sapelo Island. And on these, I employ, you know, for those of you who know anything about sewing, there's applique, there's reverse applique, uh, and then there's free motion quilt. And so there's several different techniques on here. I have fun making those uh, inlets in the marshland. This is a beloved spot in central Georgia. It's Spruill Bluff on the Flint River. President Carter has saved this from destruction several times during his life, and he may have to do it again. Um, but it's just this beautiful spot. It's a state park. It's really beautiful. This is uh, the Alabama Tallapoosa on the left and the Chattahoochee Flint Apalachicola on the right. It is a screen that is owned by a friend of mine who is an environmentalist, a scientist, a biologist. And she had this screen come to her through her family. It was in uh, sort of bad shape, but she called me and asked me if I would consider uh, replacing the screen that was in there with quilted works. And I said, oh, what a, what a different idea. And she said, but the woodwork has to be restored. So luckily one of my sisters, my sister Ginger Swint is a woodworker. So Ginger did the woodwork. My husband Fred painted the backdrop and then I quilted the Chattahoochee Apalachicola Flint and the Alabama Tallapoosa Coosa. And we made uh, my friend Becky this uh, quilt, this screen. And it's in her house in Auburn. <laughs> In 1944, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers commissioned a cartographer by the name of Harold Fisk to make a series of maps uh, indicating the historical meanderings of the Mississippi River. 
from top to bottom. So Mr. Fisk set out doing that and he made this set of 15 maps. Well, they don't go quite to the top of the Mississippi. They start in Cape Girardeau, uh, Missouri, and they go down into way south Louisiana. But it's 15 maps. You can see them online. They're beautiful maps. But they depict the historical meanderings of the Mississippi. And I have done three of them. This is map, uh, Fisk map number one. It stop, starts in Cape Girardeau up there. And here's where the Ohio comes in. The Ohio, uh, the current, or 1944 current uh, course of the Mississippi is the dark brown that you see, that you see coming, see the dark brown here, and then uh, the down here. The Ohio comes in right here. Cairo is right there, and the, comes down here. I have a good friend who grew up in Cairo, and he talks about when he was a teenager, he and his cousins and friends would water ski down the Mississippi and up the Ohio. What a great American story, huh? Well, um, each of the different colors on this map represents a different historical meandering of the Mississippi so that, for instance, that red one right there might be where the Mississippi was in 1202. That yellow one up there might be where the Mississippi was in 700 BC. That orange one down there might be where it was and you know I don't have the key here there is a key and I don't have the key here but um and I don't put the key on the map I've thought about putting it on the back I might do that on a little printout thing but um there's a little close-up uh, I use ink tense dye pencils to make these colors but then because there are not enough colors in the ink tents in the dye set to as there are not as many colors as there are historical meanderings of the Mississippi, I, uh, I delineate further with um, stitching so that you can see that that green is a different uh, course from this green. Even though they're the same color, that one's got a different stitching from this one. And this one is a different course from this. So anyway, that's Fisk map number one. And I've done, did I say I've done three of them? And I've entertained the notion of doing all 15, but whew, <laughs> I would take some time commit and commitment. Um, lately, I've been making river scrolls. I love making these scrolls. There's the Mulgee in Middle Georgia on the right, and there's the Chattahoochee as she courses through Columbus and Phoenix City there in the middle and on the left. Um, there's a close up of the that's an 18 mile stretch that, as the river goes through Columbus and Phoenix City. It's the length of the river walk where I walk it, it just about every day. Um, this is the uh, Okoe up in Tennessee. And I've made one of the new river in Virginia and I'm gonna make some more. I like the river scrolls. They were inspired by a Japanese scroll we have hanging in our home that one of our cousins, we have a cousin-in-law who's Japanese and she came back from a trip home one time and brought us a, uh, a scroll that we love. And so the scroll is part of what inspired my river scrolls, but it was all, they're also inspired by, if you've never seen these things, they're online too. They are the Mississippi ribbon quilts. Back in Victorian times when people dressed up, you know, dressed to the hilt and rode the river boats, there were these little roll out maps, much like a tape measure that you could, I think in some cases you actually, they attached to your belt and you could pull them out and see where you were on the Mississippi. Uh, they're just beautiful to look at, but look them up online and there's words on them that tell, you know, what, what, what you're looking at here on the Mississippi. So um, those were part of the inspiration for uh, my scrolls. I've even thought about making one of these for the Chattahoochee, but I make it still. I uh, regularly make uh, one of my, this, I make the river systems of all the states in the union and some foreign countries. And I've made Alabama a number of times. I also do uh, the, uh, and I make these on demand just as people order. Um, I also have done the counties of Alabama, but I'm not gonna do the counties of Georgia because they're about 9 million. I thought I'd just show y'all a few more of my uh, river pillars. 
on the upper left, I, I really like this one. It, it was a little challenging to come up with how to do this. This is the uh, Alabama, she goes through Montgomery. So, yeah, there we are. There's Montgomery right there and right there, some of the street grid of Montgomery. So that's the Alabama. And this is the Chattahoochee, Flint, Apalachicola, my home river. I've lived right in here my whole life. This, of course, is the rivers of Texas. This is, again, the Tennessee River in North Alabama. People love that one. This is Lake Guntersville. There's a woman over there who's ordered numerous of Lake Guntersville for her friends and family, but she wants them all a little different. And uh, sometimes she wants a red heart or a star or something where her recipient lives. And then this is a different colored version of the Lake Fontana in North Carolina. Now, leaving maps for a minute and, and going to the floral terrain, uh, I've been on a Cahaba lily making kick and I've made these Cahaba lilies out of hand dyed fabric. They measure about 26 inches high, 25. They vary from 23 to 26 in any direction. There's a close up of the Cahaba lily. There's another Cahaba lily. I thought that the stripes in the back might look like swamp. I hope, they, I hope it does. There's another one. Ashes and free motion quilting. There's another one. Uh, here are four flowers. They're 24 inches square exactly. They're hanging right now out in Southside Gallery in Oxford, Mississippi. And on the upper left is the night blooming Sirius. Eudora Welty used to grow those and host you night blooming series parties. So Mississippi people relate to that. On the right, of course, is Yal's Cahaba Lily. And on the bottom right is Mississippi State Wildflower, the Coreopsis. And on the bottom left, I had to throw in little Georgia. On the bottom left is a rare, rare wildflower that grows in one spot in central Georgia. It's called the fringed campion. It grows in a few places in Florida and one spot in central Georgia. There's a close up of my night bloom and cirrus glow. I got that glow on there with a little bit of uh, netting. And there's the fringe of the fringed campion. Now let's skip to the literary landscape. I taught literature for 28 years. So I, I, I don't wanna, you know, I can't leave that. I don't wanna leave that. So I'm really inspired. This is uh, a collaboration between my husband, Fred and myself. I don't draw, but Fred draws well. So this is, uh, we call the title of this is graphic novel version of William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Uh, and on the top, it, 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 it didn't start out being that, but it wound up being, I mean, it started out being an As I Lay Dying quilt, but we realized after we started work on it that we wanted to put the images in sequence. And it turned out to be not just a sequential plot summary of As I Lay Dying, but also a character study, each of the different characters in As I Lay Dying is represented there. And I won't go into that too. I could talk for a couple of hours about this quilt, but um, up on the upper left, you have uh, Addie Bundren, who is the person who is lying dying as the book opens. And of course, in the first few pages, she does die. Well, we sold this quilt to a collector and it went to a wonderful home. The, I mean, this quilt, but we missed it. It's, uh, it's about four feet by four feet. And it was in our living room for a while and then we sold it and we missed it. So we decided, I decided to make, uh, to take the individual blocks and make them, you know, into quilts. So this is about five feet tall. And it really is a quilt, it's Addie on her deathbed, Addie Bundren on her deathbed, or as she lay dying. And um, it really is a little quilt within a quilt. I made a little tiny, well, it's not that tiny, but I made a little quilt and put on there. So that's Addie Bundren. Oh, this found a great home in, fittingly enough, Oxford, Mississippi, where the owner tells me it gets lots of conversation. It, it inspires lots of conversation. And this, of course, is the last line of As I Lay Dying. Um, I won't go into the story, I could, but it's the last line of As I Lay Dying. Leaving Faulkner behind and turning to Flannery O'Connor, 
the misfit and his cronies. If you've ever read the short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, there's a mega villain and he is the misfit and he has these two cronies. So Fred's drawing, my sewing, we've made these literary quilts and we wanna make a whole lot more. What I'd like to do is do a series called Southern Lit 101 and yeah, and have, you know, eight or 10 quilts, but um, we've, we have that in the, in the plan, uh, but we haven't completed them yet. We keep getting distracted by map quilts and Fred's paintings and other things. So lastly, y'all come see me sometimes. Uh, either come visit me online. Uh, there's my website, there's my email address, and there's a map from here to Columbus. We live in Columbus. We like studio visits. So whenever this uh, COVID thing is under a little bit better control, if you're near Columbus or if you just make a trip to Columbus, uh, we would love for you to visit our studios. Now our studios are in our home. So let us know ahead of time so we won't have dirty dishes in the sink, but we would love to have you visit our studios. And it's an interesting place. And again, we'd love to have you. So I think we are ready to open the floor for questions. If anyone's got questions, I'll bring you the microphone. Um, when you copy the maps onto the fabric, yeah. what tools do you use? Okay, that's a good question. I print out every single map onto paper. I've, I've tried projecting and it doesn't work for me. Uh, for one thing, I don't like to work there. I like to work there. So I print onto paper and then depending on the fabric I'm using, if I'm using a dark fabric, I can't use my light board. In which case I, tr well, I trace some way or other. Uh, there's a lot of tracing that goes on here. If it's a see-through fabric, and, you know, like the white canvas, I put it onto my light board and just trace directly onto the fabric with a water soluble or heat erasable pen. And, and so that way. But if it's a dark fabric, I trace onto water soluble stabilizer. It, it's almost like saran wrap. It's sulky. If you know, if you sew, it's sulky. It's got brand name, but it's, it's very much like saran wrap. I trace onto the saran wrap. I pin this, it's not saran wrap. And I pin it onto the map and then I sew through it. I sew through the tracing paper and tear it away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to come up with all that. And, and I've changed over time. I've, 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 you know, switched around and I still continue to try different products, uh, but the sulky water soluble works for me. And it seems like it's gonna be all flimsy and saran wrappy, and it's not as hard to handle it as it seems it would be when you pull it off that roll. Does that answer? Does that? Trace I got that. another question for you, Kathy. Okay. Hi, Kathy. Hi. I have damaged a few machines doing free motion quilting. What is your favorite machine to use that works well? I have, well, I have a Juki straight stitch, Juki straight stitch. And I, almost everything I've made in the last 10 years that I've had that machine, I've made on the Juki. I recently bought a fancier machine uh, with some zigzag, because I needed a zigzag every now and then but I still go to my Juki. It's just, you know, it's a heavy duty metal machine. They just don't break. And I really love my Juki. Uh, I recently also bought a big fancy quilting machine, which I'm ready to throw in the Chattahoochee River. But uh, <laughs> Fred doesn't even want to get me started. But anyway, um, you know, but there are a lot of, you know, almost any machine you can rig to, uh, to free motion quilt. But I think the heavier machines, like the older uh, uh, metal machines, uh, you need something a little heavy because you're going to be pushing that thing around. So, you know, you need a heavier machine, but straight stitch machine for me. Anybody else? We've got a lot in the virtual world. Oh, we got two questions over here. Hold on just a second. Speak into the mic. 
the work is lovely. I'm just curious about time. How much time or something okay. versus complicated? Yeah. Okay. I sew every single day, several hours. I just love it. I've been, I just have always loved sewing. And I, um, you know, back when I taught school, I would come in from school in the afternoon and I also directed drama. And, you know, I would go into the den and decompress by hand quilting. And um, quilting brings me great solace. Uh, it is a meditative act for me. It is not a social act as it is for some people. I just love it. But back to time, I work in my studio several hours every day, probably six hours a lot of days, but my studio is right in the middle of my house. It's between my kitchen and my bedroom. So it's not like I have to go to it. It's not like I even have to go upstairs or downstairs. It's just right there. So I'm in and out of there all day long. But I put in two hours at least this morning before we left to come over here. Um, so several hours every day. So every day. It is a rare, rare, rare day. I'm either on the road or sick. And even when I'm sick, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but several hours every day. Um, what inspired your interest in the maps? I mean, where'd that come from? Well, you know, I've always liked maps. And when I was a kid, uh, we traveled a lot around the South. My dad was a water pipeline construction superintendent. He put in the water systems of Birmingham and Tupelo and all over the place. So even though we had a home in Buena Vista, we traveled to visit him. And in the summers, we would go wherever he was. We traveled all over the South. And I was, off, I was the oldest of six kids, and I was often the navigator. And I just came to love maps and and. I don't know any except for that, but I, I also love uh, in, you know, in artful compositions, I love curves and rivers provide me that. And so do contour lines. So, Matina, do you want to pipe in with some questions from Zoom? Absolutely. Um, for new fiber artists or quilters just starting out, what advice do you have and what do you wish you had done differently when you were first learning? That's, that's the, same, the same answer for both of those. My advice is don't let a focus on precision stymie you. You know, a focus on precision in quilting <laughs> can really slow you down and really discourage you. Just get in there and play and make mistakes and do what you want to do. And don't worry about what some people refer to as the quilt police who are looking at whether your corners match or whether your points are pointy or whether your stitches are all the same length. Don't worry about precision. You can, do, you can come to that later. You may or may not ever want to come to super precision the way some quilters, I mean, I know some incredible quilters who are focused on precision and I'm not dissing that. I'm not criticizing that. And I can quilt precisely too. But um, to be overly hyper-focused on precision from the beginning can really hang you up. It can, it can discourage you. So don't be so focused on precision. And I wish I had not been. Uh, Another I, yeah, that's it, that's it. Another question we have from the virtual world is, are the rivers applique with raw edges showing or are they reverse applique? It, some one way and some, I have tried, I do the rivers in all different kinds of ways and I'm still playing with that. Uh, it varies from quilt to quilt. Some are reverse applique, not many. Some of the smaller ones are reverse applique. Most of them are applique with raw edges, but I've, I've been doing different things with the edges in terms of finishing those raw edges. Uh, I'm still playing with that. We have another participant who asks, do you research the history of each quilt's geography before you decide to make a quilt of it? Or do you find visually interesting locations and then search the history after? Um, I, when I'm doing my own work, I usually look, well, some of both, some of both, but I'm more inclined to look for the visual appeal that when I'm doing my own work. Now, if it's a commission, and I do take a few, I, I know I've said commission a number of times and it sounds like I've done a lot of commissions. I don't do many commissions. I have to really want to do it. It has to be something that I think I can really do a good job of. And let me tell you that sometimes 
Grandma's farm is probably really beautiful if you're there at Grandma's farm and the grass is green and the trees are big and all that. But from the air, which is where I'm working, it may not be so beautiful, you know. So I have to really look at that and think about whether I can, when I when I have a request for a commission, whether I can really do that in a way that will be pleasing to the client. But um, so in that, sometimes I'm looking at the history. And if somebody asks me to make a quilt of a particular place, I tend to look at the history there because sometimes I have questions about what is that? Is that, you know, what is that shape over there? Where'd that come from? Um, so a little of both. Um, yeah. That's all the questions we've got from Zoom. Are there any more final ones here? Oh yeah, we got one more. The composition of the fabric, you said you used canvas. Yeah. Do you, are most of them canvas or a mix? I mean, other than the flowers, which were your own Yeah, most, of, most of all my mat quilts are canvas. I think they just, I just like the, the, the drape, the, the way they hang, they seem substantial. Um, the Providence Canyon quilt is not canvas. That's regular quilting weight. If it's hand dyed, I don't hand dye canvas. It, canvas doesn't take dye well. Um, but most of my map quilts are canvas. Do you use like wool batting for the drape or you prefer? I use house? almost exclusively cotton. I do use wool sometimes and I love wool batting but I get a better deal on the cotton batting yeah. and it comes in the huge rolls. You know, if I were to buy wool batting, I don't think it comes on big rolls. I could only buy one, one bed size piece and I might waste a bunch of it. But if when I buy the big, you know, what is it? 50 yard roll of cotton batting, I can use whatever I need off there. So it's just a lot more economical. And they're about, you know, they're so close really in okay. some ways. Thank you. Oh, we got we got some more. We got them coming. You guys are next. I love questions. You said you quilt several hours a day, but I wondered how many days or months it takes to do one of those pieces. Oh, I can do one of the map quilts. Depends on the size, but um, I can do, a, let's see, that coon dog thing that's about two feet by three feet. I actually made that in about a week. Okay. But I'm on the machine now, you know, I'm not, I mean, if it's by hand, it's way longer. Right. And the second question is, if you're using a cotton, do you use any sort of pellon or stabilizer under that? No. Okay. I have on occasion, but I don't, I don't need to really. Okay. Thank you. I'm coming over to you guys now. While you're making your way over there, I have I just thought of something that's kind of funny that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, exhibited over at Kentuck uh, several years ago, and I displayed that uh, Alabama River at G's Bend and a bunch, and several other things. And y'all, the fishermen who <laughs> I got more great stories from the fishermen who wanted to point out their fishing spot <laughs> all over the place. I know more about fishing holes on the Alabama River than and the Black Warrior River. It was great fun, but I don't think I've ever absorbed in it. Every quilt has a story. Well, some quilts have a whole bunch of stories if the fishermen are nearby. Just wondered if you treat the canvas in any way to keep the edges from fraying no. too much when you... No, I wash it before I work. And then I do, though, uh, use an adhesive to stick the river down. And the adhesive I use actually does seal the edges. Ah. But I use the adhesive and then I sew. But um, I have I place it down with the adhesive first. Heat and bond is the main one I use. But I mean, there are others. Anybody else in the house? Here you go. You've said that you use canvas and quilt cotton. I'm curious to know what your favorite threads are. Huh, that's a great question. I thought a while ago somebody was going to ask that. I use Guterman thread almost exclusively. I love Guterman thread. I've got a good source for it. There's this company called Red Rocks out west in Nevada, and I can order from them today, and it's here tomorrow, and they know me, and they'll call and say, 
we got won't have that but we got you know I just love them and uh when I bought my Juki from uh the place in Opelika the man there who owns the shop told me that I would probably be happy with Guterman thread with my Juki and I am and um now you know every now and then I'll use some other thread for effect like on the Cahaba lilies I use some uh well, I think that was Juki too. I used some sparkly, some uh, shiny, some copper colored thread to make some glint on the water. But um, I use primarily uh, Guterman. You've mentioned G's Bend several times. I'm just curious if you were ever influenced or collaborated. Very with much. Many. Well, I, you know, I, I think almost everybody in the quilt world has been influenced by the G's Bend quilts and quilters. And I really uh, love most of the cheese pin quilts. And uh, actually, I think of the way I, the reason I ever even made that part of the river was that I was thinking about going over to G's Bend. I still haven't been to G's Bend, but I was looking at maps, looking for how to get from Columbus to G's Bend. And there was that map, that river. And so I think of my G's, that one, I mean, that you know, the ones you've seen. I think of those sort of as homages to the G's Bend quilters. Uh, I tell you when I, you know, and the G's Bend quilters have had such a profound effect on the quilting world in terms of broadening our aesthetic. You know, it, they've broadened the aesthetic of the quilting world, which we were in need of. Um, when I saw that the G's Bend quilts were going into the Metropolitan Museum, I just was in tears of joy. And then I went to the Met and saw them and cried again. Uh, I've met a couple of the G's Bend quilters, Louisiana Bendolph and Marianne Petway, and really love their work. And um, yes, I've been very, uh, I'm not gonna copy their work, I'm not gonna try to, you know, but um, I do greatly admire their work and their tenacity. Anybody else? Oh, we got one more. This one over. Uh, you said you had been teaching for for a long time. Yes. And then you went into quilting. So how did you start? Did you start with a group or did you? No. Um, did you... I've been sewing since I was four years old. My mother was a great seamstress. My grandmother was a great seamstress. My mother didn't quilt. They, her family had quit quilting at some point in the forties, but but quilts were all around me. And then when I was, so I've been sewing, I sewed all through high school, all through college. But when I was 19, uh, my best friend's mother started sewing in a sort of revivalist way. And I was around her a lot. And she was a professional, she was our town librarian. And so, I, you know, I, I, learned, I watched her. She never gave me lessons but I was in, greatly inspired by her and how I watched her. And um, that's the way I did it. I've been a lone wolf quilter. I didn't have time to go to Guild. I didn't have, I was teaching school. I didn't have time to go to that's Guild. Fine. I didn't have time to go to classes. I was a lone wolf quilter. I probably would be a better quilter if I had gone to some workshops, but I didn't have time. And as I said earlier, Quilting is really, uh, it's not a social act for me. I don't enjoy being in a big room with a bunch of people sewing. I enjoy, I mean, I just, I'm sorry, I just don't. I know people do. I, some of my quilting friends just love that stuff, but I like to be in my studio alone uh, thinking about it. And uh, I do enjoy collaborating with maybe one person. Uh, I collaborate sometimes with my daughter, who's a quilter or with my husband, Fred, who draws. And I have another couple of friends that, who are artistic that I'll ask to come in and look at this and tell me what you think uh, or add some something to it. But I don't, I don't quilt as a social act. But then you exhibit. I do exhibit. How did that come about? Um, oh, <laughs> um, th that's an interesting story. Uh, I mentioned that we live in a cotton mill in Columbus and also in that cotton mill are the very well regarded uh, is uh, American realist painter, Bo Bartlett. Bo Bartlett and his wife, Betsy Eby have studios on either side of us. 
and uh, Bo and Betsy were having an open ha house and s holiday sale. They have a local holiday sale at, at Christmas or did before COVID and Bo sells prints. And so they were having one of those and um, ask us if we wanted to participate. And I had never sold a quilt. This was what, six or seven years ago. I'd never sold a quilt. I'd not even really thought about it. But when they, but I had all these quilts accumulating. So uh, they encouraged us to, you know, to kick in with them on this open house. And we did. And let's just say I had a very successful day. <laughs> Thanks to the hundreds of people who came in to see Bo and Betsy's work, but it was the start of my unanticipated second career, uh, and it's been great fun. But I give them a lot of credit for uh, for that opportunity. I think with that we're going to wrap. She'll be available in the gallery for questions. Let's give Kathy a hand. Thank you so much for coming. Thank y'all.